Thanks for coming on in here. And uh, so let me get started. Um, I'm Mark and Addy. I'm the VP of IT with a company called Extreme Reach. You've probably never heard of us, but you watch TV, you see commercials, and 80% of those commercials come through our business. And I'll explain a little bit about that in just a moment. And, um, and, and I'm a, a solution architect associate. Uh, I did that uh, back in 2017, and that was very helpful. And I'll chat about certs and uh, having experts and SMEs on your team as well. But let's dive in. Today, I'm going to cover what does Extreme Reach do, just to give you a little bit of background on what our business is, um, what we use to do it, what we migrated and why, some things we learned, and I, I'll sprinkle in a few anecdotes, and hopefully I'll have time because I've got a lot of stories. We've, we've got a big company. We've got 19 locations. Uh, New York, LA, Chicago, all of those big ones. We've got a, a great support footprint in Kentucky. We utilize cloud services. We're a multi-cloud user. And, uh, and we've been at it since 2009 when the cloud was not cool. I don't know if you remember back then, but you had to sell customers on the value of the cloud. Like if you were using the cloud, they were questioning your veracity on using the cloud. So you had to justify it. But I think that turned in probably 2011, 2012 is when that sort of shifted and it became like, why aren't you in the cloud, right? So my company, Extreme Reach, and by the way, I'm the moderator of the Boston Amazon Meetup Group, but I don't work for Amazon, so I do have a lot of freedom in what I can say. Um, but our company, my company, is all about full life cycle advertising asset management. I know those are big words, but basically we process and work with advertisements, primarily video advertisements. We will treat those, come on in guys, come on in. And uh, we'll do all sorts of creation and production, post-production work, we'll embed uh, watermarks, things like that. We do talent and rights management where we, we process 80% of the uh, talent in the United States. They hang their hat on us for payroll and related services. We do traffic and clearance. We do the delivery. We do digital ad serving and then storage and asset management, including uh, hard copy. You know, we've got warehouses of, of stuff. So this is like a lot of things that are behind the scenes. We're primarily a business to business. Uh, offering all of these different constituents here a part of the advertising workflow. We're right in the center of it, which is a great place to be um, because our advertisers and, and talent agencies, they primarily are our customers, but we have customers that are post houses, 3,000 of them, actors and rights owners, 120,000. You know, when you see that commercial on TV, you probably didn't think that that music was copyrighted, that there's a contract for that music, that if that music were to play outside the boundaries of the contracted period, that there could be penalties, including actors and things like that. That if you're going to have a, a child actor in a commercial, that you need to make sure that there are certain um, laws and regulations that that child actor doesn't violate. So we do all of this kind of stuff. We've got 800 plus people in our company spread throughout the United States and the UK. And, uh, and this is a lot of it, but I don't want to make this an infomercial on extreme reach. I just wanted to expose you to a company that you probably haven't heard of, but you've seen TV commercials that have come through our company, 80% of those commercials that come through our company, including uh, things like your Snuggie commercials and your long form content or uh, syndicated shows which we embed ads. So how do we do this? We have a lot of technology. Again, we started in 2009. So I remember when we, when we first started, we were using Amazon S3. So that was, if you remember 2009, Amazon S3 was like barely starting, right? It had just uh, rolled out. But we, we got that in place, and I think we were using ASP.NET was a site back then that we were hosting uh, IIS and database and things like that. But we click, quickly moved off of that and started building out data centers. And that uh, went over a period of years where we built out data centers. We acquired several companies that had different technologies. And so today, where we've landed today is 
We are primarily EC2 hosted, so we did a lot of uh, shift, lift, and move and brought it into the cloud. We've got um, app and API servers that are multi-regioned, AZ, they're behind ELBs, they're primarily Windows instances. We've got uh, batch processing servers, video quality control, FTP, monitoring, Active Directory, and all of those other services that you need to get into the cloud when you're going to put something in. You can't just stand up a server, right? You need a lot of that supporting infrastructure. We have transcoding. So this was a big one for us um, because it requires extensive hardware infrastructure, uh, high GPU load for transcoding video between one uh, format to another format or customizing that format because when you watch a TV on commercial all of those commercials are transcoded to the broadcaster whatever their output equipment is and we actually treat that video we will insert uh, frames of black and space and other things we will put Nielsen watermarking in there we will do all sorts of things with that video content. I hope I'm keeping your attention on this because this can be rather boring, but again, it's stuff like you just, you watch a commercial, you just don't think of all the stuff that goes in behind the scenes. We're the behind the scenes person. Again, we've been using S3 and CloudFront primarily for our CDN. By the way, most of these services we have backups for, they're either in Amazon or we use another provider for backups of these services. And then, uh, we have multiple accounts, all of these other AWS services. Route 53 was something that we went to. If anybody remembers the Dyn incident of 2016, Dyn was our primary uh, DNS provider, and we were using traffic management and specialized tools on Dyn, and when that incident happened, we slammed over our DNS to Route 53, and that's where we've been ever since, and we utilize uh, Dine, or uh, Amazon's uh, traffic management and routing policies and things like that. So, and Dyn is now our backup. And no slight against Dyn. Dyn was a great company. We just, we were out and we needed to make a choice. I don't know how many of you maybe have been affected by that event in 2016. But it was a real motivator for us to, to make a shift. We've been using simple queue services since the beginning. Since they were early uh, available, they, that proved out to be a really good workflow for us and we use it to this day, Simple Queue Services. And of course, Systems Manager for releasing primarily Windows updates. We use it for a couple of other things. Recently, we rolled out an AV solution and we did that through Systems Manager. Uh, cloud Formation, we also use that as part of the uh, antivirus uh, rollout. Uh, cloud Trail, Config, Trusted Advisor, these other tools we use and we have several Direct Connect. So let me just show you a little more detail. Um, DNS, or rather, I'm sorry, database and caching. We host a Microsoft SQL cluster in the cloud on EC2 instances. It's a 2016 cluster. It's multiple AZs and it's across regions. We, we could not go to RDS and I'll chat about that in just a moment. Um, we also have a, so I'm gonna be talking a lot about what I call our platform. Extreme Reach platform, and that's what's customer facing, and that's what, what people deal with, and that's a lot of the infrastructure I'm going to be talking to you about. But we have a whole digital ad serving infrastructure that was primarily a mixture of on prem and cloud, similar to our platform, but now is all in cloud infrastructure. And over the last couple of years, we migrated that infrastructure into the cloud. But I'm not going to go in depth in that. I may touch upon it here and there for a story or two. But for the most part, I'm gonna be talking about our platform. And um, as part of that, uh, the digital infrastructure, which has MySQL, they've got an ELK stack that has been assembled and that works good to just bubble up, uh, uh, cut through the noise and bubble up important items. We haven't reached the point where we're going to offload that yet because it's working quite well in its simplistic form. But as soon as you go to scale ELK, if any of, the, of you are aware of that, there's a lot of pros and cons to, to bringing that into a bigger uh, solution. And then uh, we're using Aurora, MySQL compatible for digital video and campaign metrics and things. Um, we're also using DynamoDB and a lot of ElastiCache and Elasticsearch, which has really helped us scale our databases and get away from lags and things that you would normally have with direct database calls. So I'm hoping a lot of this makes sense to you. This is our platform today, not the digital side. I'll show that to you in a moment. 
And, and really, this is not covering everything, but it's a pretty high level of what we have with our, our customers. We also have remote agents that we use for uploading and downloading video files. So we, we have to get content in and out. So we've built our own Java-based agents that we deploy to our customers. We have hundreds of those deployed and that we maintain. And of course, we have our API that we work with with our, our customers and partners. And then as part of the, the primary cloud infrastructure, th this should be pretty recognizable to most of you. You've got an ELB. Uh, we're using WAF to, to highlight some threats and uh, get them out of the way. We're using CloudFront for certain deliveries, S3 for quite a bit of our storage. And we actually use an east and west implementation of S3. The east is more of the long-term repository, and the west is more of a short term. And we do that mostly for localization to, to make things available there. And then, like I shared earlier, we're using simple queue services and some of our caching services to offload our database infrastructure. And then these are our just our different server types, the batch and the transcode and the quality control. And, and then, of course, we've got monitoring, security, config, and management. So we run separate servers. One of the things that we do run in our environment is PRTG. Some of you are like, I've never heard of that monitoring solution. Some of you are like, yeah, I've heard of PRTG. It was something we implemented years ago, and we, it just grew and grew and grew. And if you've implemented a monitoring solution, then you know that you build upon it and you build upon it, and it's very challenging to move to anything else once you've done all of that customization. And I would say we're probably a typical company to maybe some of you, that you've got a company where you're not starting from scratch, you have actually have a lot of legacy infrastructure, which we do. We've had numerous acquisitions over the year. So with that comes all the baggage of all of those other companies, right? And you, you integrate what you can. And other things, it's like, OK, how do I keep the Band-Aids on to keep it going, right? So uh, we've, we've had a lot of that collection. And the, the platform was one area where we needed to make some decisions. And so let me dive into it a bit more. By the way, this is our digital video infrastructure. We have it in a separate account altogether. It's primarily Linux-based hosts, where the platform are Windows-based hosts. And this is all about uh, getting, serving up ads, getting the beacon calls so that you can grab all of the metrics related to those ads. And we go through an audit every year called an MRC audit to make sure that we're compliant and we can properly report um, all of our ad serving statistics to our customers. And we manage their campaigns and everything. We provide the platform for that. But I'm not going to dive too much into this. I just wanted to highlight that it's an area where we've, we've done very well with our infrastructure and a lot of the, the MySQL and database related things that we used to run on on-prem data centers, that's been migrated into the cloud very successfully. So. Uh, here's one example of something that we did where we couldn't find a solution, and so we built it ourselves. And it's just FTP. So i got to ask, how many of you have a cloud-built FTP solution where you built it yourself? Anybody? Yeah. So, so this is why we built it, because I, I couldn't find, or we couldn't find, a, a good service that was cost-effective, provided us all of the, the solutions and integrations we needed to get that going, so we built it ourselves. And as you can see, it's fully redundant between east and west region. The servers themselves are redundant with redundant backups and snapshots being taken. And of course, Route 53 is helping us. We have health checks going on and everything. So just an example of one piece of infrastructure that we put together, a lot of time and energy spent on this. Would we do it again the same way? I don't know, every day is different with Amazon, right? There, there's always new features coming out, there's always easier ways to go. So if I had to start any of this today, I would definitely take a fresh look and, and identify what is it that, um, that they can do for me with their services without having to reinvent the wheel. You know what, I'm gonna take questions at the end if that's okay, only because I got a certain flow here and I just wanna keep it going and I got a lot of material to cover. But do me a favor, jot your questions down because we'll come back to you and get those questions. So here's where we came from. I described some of it. Um, we came from four geo-distributed data centers. And that's, that's a really 
um, impressive thing to say that you've got a data center. But you know what? It's just a few racks of equipment in a leased data center somewhere. We don't own the data center. We're not in the data center business, right? And if any of you run your um, workloads on-prem, then you know the operational requirements of maintaining a data center. Who, who operates with on-prem servers that are critical to your infrastructure? Anybody here? Several of you. Okay, so you're aware of environmental controls, power. If you've got a hurricane coming about, you're, you know, you're on high alert, right? You're figuring, what, figuring out what the plan is to maintain that. Frankly, I don't want to be in that business because that's not my expertise, at least not anymore. And I, I think today we all want to get out of the hosting business. Maybe some of you, that's your primary business, by the way. I don't want to mess that up. But, but <laughs> if, you're, if you're doing it yourself and your business model does not take in hosting as a revenue generator, then you don't want to be in that business, right? You want to outsource that to someone who does it, does it well, passes all of those SOC audits and dot the I's and cross the T's. So we had four distributed data centers. We had a SQL, uh, Microsoft uh, always on SQL cluster 2014 on an older server version. And it was running uh, across um, these three of the data centers that we considered to be primary. And when we started out, we could have two of those data centers go down and we could maintain business. But as we grew, now we could only have one data center down with two of those operating to supply the business requirements, right? And then that grew to a point where it was dangerous if we lost one data center, right? So that's when you know that things are getting to a point where you got to make a change, right? So uh, we had multiple API and app servers. Transcoding, I, I don't know if I talked about it too much in the last slide, but when you convert from one format to another, you need specialized software. It's very expensive, licensing. Um, and you need very powerful servers. And that's hard to replicate into the cloud. And I don't know if you recall, but Amazon and others came out with cloud transcoding solutions. But they were too simplistic for our needs. I mean, if you've got to insert a frame of black, or you need to cut off a certain part of a spot, or if you need to insert a 800 number, you know, in a certain part of the spot or do an overlay, those are things that you, you just, it's very difficult to do with cloud transcoding. Now, that may be different today. I haven't checked it out today. I just know that when, when we evaluated it, we just had to do it ourselves. And with the customized software from uh, Telestream and Harmonic, which are two of the biggies that make this transcoding software. So we've got a lot of infrastructure of transcoders. And they were spread all throughout the country to allow us to, to take on the load and do the processing that was needed. Um, FTP, Active Directory, DNS, DNS. It's the bane of all IT people. Always seems to be a problem. And what's the, what's the root of the cause of the issue? DNS, right? Always seems to be something that reoccurs. Um, Integrations, file transfers, we, hit, we uh, utilized Aspera in the, in the cloud. We still do today. That's one of our file transfer methods uh, for, for accelerated transfers. And most of our hardware was getting to end of life. And, and I'll use that, to, that term loosely because I was just talking to a 92-year-old woman uh, the other day, and she's def definitely not near end of life. But you would think, 92, man, that's pretty old, right? So, our plan when we were working all of this technology was not to say this server is only good for two years and then it's done. It was like, I bought that server, paid good money for it. I'm going to use that thing until it just can't do the job anymore, right? So we had a lot of servers that were no longer under warranty. We were pl replacing drives and things like that. And at some point, right, the operational cost of maintaining older hardware, just like you would have an old car, you know, outweighs keeping the old car, right? You have to, at some point, you need to make that decision. What I, the point I want to make here is that it's very difficult to just say, this server is only good for two years. Because our SQL servers, and I'm going to show that to you in a minute, the configuration, were heavy duty SQL servers. And then the other services I mentioned earlier. So this is where we were not too long ago. And we had this kind of infrastructure for networking connectivity between our various data centers, 
And you'll see five here because one of these is ours. And that was an acquisition that, that uh, and we still have that data center today. And we keep that. That's sort of our, we call it a scorched earth uh, business continuity plan. You know, if we get hit by the meteor, hopefully it won't hit the United States and we'll have one of our terrestrial, uh, or rather our data center to use. But these other ones, these are now gone. DEVA, two in California. Sorry about the feedback here. So why did we migrate? I brought up a few of the things along the way here, but maybe you're in a similar boat to where we were. And I'll just talk you through it. So first off, we were already operating in a hybrid mode. So we were already familiar with the cloud. And like that's really important that you have some familiarity. If your company is like, we'd like to get into the cloud, but we don't know anything about it, man, you're starting, you're way, way back here, right? Once you, we were using S3 for a long time, SQS, so we had a certain experience, but not the full experience of putting everything into the cloud. But it was definitely a motivator for us when it came time for these other reasons, which hardware, I talked about it. We had uh, five servers running the 2014, always on as a replication technology. We are a read intensive platform application. So we really needed one write database and multiple reads in different uh, geographic locations. And, and of course, we really got our money out of these servers. And I'll give you the configuration in just a moment here. And then of course, all the hardware management, the, the rack space, the power, the networking, the maintaining redundant configurations, the RAID, the backup servers, firmware updates, driver updates, you know, remotely accessing the server when it doesn't come up after Windows updates, those kinds of things, right? They're, they're quite annoying. They take a lot of operational energy. Software and licensing. So we had a point where we needed to upgrade, but now we were gonna have to shell out a lot of money in Microsoft SQL licensing and server licensing. And that was weighing on us too, because that's tens of thousands, hundred, hundred, couple of hundred thousand is what we were looking at in pricing for what we needed to do. Um, the data center contract, so this was a big one for us as well. They were expiring in the end of 2017. So that was a motivator for us. Do we, do we stay and renew or do we cut the cord, right? So that was a big one for us was the data centers retiring. Um, internet circuits and all the related costs of maintaining your own networking infrastructure the circuits alone are very expensive. You know that, right? Um, but all of the infrastructure to support that, the routers, the core switches, firewalls, all of that very expensive to maintain. And you have to upgrade all of those things and be on top of it, right? So you have a team of people dedicated to that. And of course, scaling, if you're, in, if you're on prem, it's very difficult to scale. You gotta buy for what you expect to expand to. I know I'm preaching to the choir on a number of these things, so I'm sorry if this is a bit remedial. And we're right after lunch, so you get the snoozies going on. But that's OK. Hopefully, I'm keeping you a bit awake here. And then, of course, I mentioned it numerous times, the engineering support uh, of you know, having to, to focus on hardware versus automation. It was, just, it was just a real drag. Hard to get projects done when you're fixing and maintaining old stuff. And all of the other reasons that you heard today downstairs all of the benefits of cloud technologies, right? There's just so many benefits that it's really difficult to fail in the cloud if you, if you don't just, if you take the time, explore it, understand what your options are. If you are gonna fail, you can fail fast and you can move forward. So, some things that we learned, and I love this movie, by the way. That's the only reason why I put it up there. All right, so, <laughs> So we had this cluster I was talking about. This was our most challenging situation. Transcoders into the cloud, yeah, there was testing. We had to find certain server types, you know, AMIs that we wanted to work with. We had configuration, things like that. But, but really, the most challenging thing for us was database, right? Getting the database into the cloud. And so we had Dell R710 servers. Some of you are going to know this. Some of you are going to like, that doesn't matter. But, you know, 16 cores each. Uh, with a perk rate. Here's a big thing I want to point out. We had these Fusion I.O. flash drives. And if you're not familiar with this, this is, this is hard drives on super steroids. This is like, this is the way to increase your I.O. significantly. So we migrated all of this. We were going to go into RDS. We didn't do that because we couldn't, 
we couldn't implement, back then, by the way, in, in 2017, we could not implement an RDS configuration that would take the full load of our platform and have multiple read-only nodes. So we, we just couldn't build it out enough to, to do one big migration to RDS. It's probably in the future, for sure, but right now, we were stuck with, okay, we're gonna have to, to lift and shift. So we set up EC2 instances, and um, I'm gonna move on here. Let me just do that. Uh, we had to right size the Amazon machine image, and this took us a lot of time. We, we had to measure the IOPS and such, and the CPU, and all of the, the computing that was required to run this cluster, but I'll tell you something that got us. It was those flash drives. That's what got us. We did not fully anticipate the load that was being relieved of the database using high-end I.O. on the hardware. And when we moved the databases into the cloud, we realized that the bottleneck wasn't CPU because where we were going is we were having CPU bottlenecks. We, we weren't having I.O. bottlenecks. And when we moved to the cloud, that flipped around. CPU was fine, but I.O. was a challenge. And we now needed to, we had to go to provisioned IOPS and do a number of things like that. And, and if you over-provision these machines, especially when you tack on Microsoft licensing, SQL licensing, that's very expensive to run a SQL cluster in the cloud. Um, so we also had uh, replication challenges as well in replicating the, the SQL build. So we had to use our own licensing. We had to build the servers basically from scratch. And then we had to come up with a method of, of imaging it as much as we could so that we could replicate it and build the other nodes. And that took several iterations of engineer time to actually build that out. And of course, licensing, right? Um, one of the things we had with our Microsoft SQL licensing is we did not have cloud mobility. And some of you that may ring a bell or not where you can just take your SQL licensing and just bring it to the cloud. So we didn't have that. And as part of that, um, we were, it looked like we were gonna have to pay for everything, but then we discovered that you could take your Microsoft SQL Server licensing and put them on dedicated instances. So you pay more for a dedicated instance. I think it's a monthly charge of uh, $1,100 a month. I, don't quote me on that, but it's somewhere around there where you pay for your first dedicated instance because Amazon is now dedicating a virtual machine for you, right? A hardware host and, and dedicated machine. And when we did that, then we were able to move our licensing, the various cores that we had over to dedicated instances and save on those charges. So it involved us installing our own licensing on those instances. And then, of course, we got bit a couple of times on service limits and account limits. And you know, something as simple as you, you don't have any more IPs available or you exceeded the IOPS on an EBS volume that was attached to a database server and you're like scratching your head like why am I not getting the throughput that I should? Well, it's limits. So I highly recommend you just do the Google search, AWS limits and find those white papers that talk about the various products you're using so that you are up on what those limits are and how they'll get you because they will get you. They got us a couple of times uh, in the course of this migration. So some other things that we learned, God bless you, Adam West, um, migrating in stages. So one of the things we did early on is we took our transcoding fleet, which was probably about uh, 70, 80 servers around there, and we started migrating those into the cloud because uh, it was a, a massive number of servers that were easy to replicate. And once we got the model down, we could get those replicated into the cloud. And we timed it so that we had enough built out while we were still operating on-prem. And, and by the way, finances is always part of this discussion. I don't have much on finances here in these slides, but, but that's a huge discussion with engineering management is how much is this gonna cost, right? You, you, it's so difficult to, to, to say, I'm gonna go into the cloud and I'm gonna save money. Because if you're gonna do a, 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 a lift and shift, 
generally you're going to spend more money because it's now OPEX, right, instead of the CAPEX that you invested in hardware and you're just riding that until it's dead, right? But you're now paying by the minute. So you have to take that into account. So we had a number of challenges in, uh, or rather, we made it easy on ourselves by migrating pieces. And that's what I would recommend. If you're planning a migration strategy, work on the things that are easy to get into the cloud. And of course, you need all of the base structure in place. You've got to set up your accounts right, your, your IAMs right, all of your security groups. There's a, there's a lot that goes into just setting up the core infrastructure, and there's cloud formation templates for this, but generally you wind up customizing it for your needs, right? And, and of course, how you're going to segment off. Um, but you have to just take that into account is moving in stages is easier than doing everything at once. Plus, you have much more ease of testing and ice, fault isolation. Right-sizing the instances, that was a big challenge for us too. I, I think we, we did a pretty good job. When we were doubtful as to critical server functions, like the, uh, oh, sound like a little bit like Barney Fife there. Um, it, when you had some critical server functions like database servers, we would overcompensate and implement a bigger instance size, and then we would work on pulling that back because we just didn't know exactly what to expect with full production load. And of course, if you're, if you're a developer, any developers in this room? Developers? Maybe, no? Okay, but mostly IT maybe? IT? Yeah? Okay. Um, anybody still awake? <laughs> but I, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, code is written and it, it may not necessarily take into account the database performance or the fact that Joe right next to you wrote some code that's calling upon that same function but maybe is abusing it and now you're going to be dealing with performance issues, right? So all of those kinds of things have to come into play with right-sizing your instances. So a lot of these things, we started big and scaled them back. CPU versus IOPS, again, we were challenged with CPU when we were on-prem, and then we were challenged with, with uh, IOPS or throughput with your disk when we were in the cloud. Expertise, I, I'm going to talk about this a little more in depth, but you've got to have experts to draw upon. And I, we had a couple of people on our team, and, and I, I'll, I'll, let me take that back. We had several people on our team that were really good with Amazon, but as far as experts are concerned, a lot of that comes with experience. And that's why you have so many Amazon consulting companies out there, right? Because they're the experts, you're not, you're getting into it. So it was, don't underestimate this area of expertise that's needed. Automate early and often because you're gonna iterate on things. You're gonna get something into production or, or into dev first rather, and you're gonna be testing it, and then you're gonna have to destroy it and start again. So, it's best that you take the time to automate whatever you're doing. If it's a server build, if it's an image, uh, if it's a, a service that you need to install and configure, script it out as much as you can because you're going to be doing it again. We did a lot of these things where we just had to repeat tasks. And luckily, you know, we had several members of the team that were really good with scripting. And then security, security, thank you. Uh, security is one of those where you've got to make sure you start from the beginning with your security configurations. Don't leave it for after the fact. And, and if you don't know what you're doing on security, get an expert in there to help you out. Because it's really easy to open things up. You're, you've all probably seen the Amazon shared security model, which is we give you stuff, it's up to you to make it safe. Right? We make it safe on the back end if it's a serverless function or something where we, RDS, where we have responsibility for that configuration. But if we supply you an EC2 instance, you're on your own, right? You can get an, an, an Amazon AMI image of that instance, but further configuration, it's up to you. So I'm going to move a little more quickly here. And um, I talked about CapEx versus OpEx. This is something that requires education of your finance team and making sure that everybody's aware that, hey, we may have an uptick in our costs 
before we're going to go down. And we made sure we educated the uh, executive team that, look, this migration, it's going to cost us some, but we're going to scale it back once we make the move over. And we're going to recoup savings from the retirement of our data centers. But it's a different model, a different model. So um, dev and uh, R&D, right, these are things where you've got to be really good about cleaning up. With servers that you own and they're sitting in a data center and someone installed something and just left it running, like, who cares about that? I mean, I care, but it's not costing you money. You get a dev that runs, a, runs an instance and it just leaves that running over the weekend, that's costing you money. Nobody's doing anything with it, right? So it's a whole mindset change with your group. One thing that was a surprise to us was the inner AZ transfers. So we had all sorts of file movements that were going between uh, availability zones within a region. And all of a sudden we're looking at the bill and it's like, oh my gosh, we're spending you know, 10,000 a month on transfers going back and forth within our own solution. So we had to re-architect how we were doing file movement to make sure that we optimized what was going in and out of S3 and how it was being transferred between servers. This is primarily related to transcoding that because we, we have large files. HD files are, are really big and we do some long form content that are 20 minutes, an hour long. Those are even bigger files. So to move those things around takes a lot of time and a lot of cost. So be aware of that. Buying RIs, that was another area where we needed to make sure that we picked them right. So we went through several iterations of deciding what kind of reserved instances we were going to get, what region, what type they were. Back then in, in early 2017, there wasn't as many options as there are today where you can mix and match and run multi-region and change your instance. I, like we didn't, we didn't have those many options, so we had to be pretty certain like, okay, these are servers I'm gonna run most of the time and I'm gonna uh, make sure that, that, uh, that I pay for it in advance. One thing we did do though, is because the technology changes so quickly, we only went with one year on any RI contract and we only did the 50% upfront because when we paid the total upfront, it was a huge cash outlay. It's a huge cash outlay to do just half, but it was a huge cash outlay to do the, the total upfront and the percentage increase of savings, very little. So 50% down and, uh, and then of course, what you need to, what you may not understand is that you're, you paid 50% upfront but you're still getting charged the 50% on month to month. So you have to work with your finance team to say, look, here's a cash outlay. We're going to buy this down, but you're going to book that and journal it on a monthly basis for 12 months because it's going to have to, you're going to have to deduct it out, right? Somehow, some way, accounting needs to make sure that, that they process that. Um, so we did that. So, so from a budgeting perspective, an engineering management team needed to say, okay, we've got 30,000 that's divided by 12, right? That on top of what our monthly costs are for EC2 instances. Your disaster recovery and business continuity plan, those you've got to make sure you're, you're planning for multi-region, multi-AZ, right, within a region, and even multi-provider, we use different providers as well. Um, and then there, your cross VPC connectivity, that could result in significant funds if you have something that um, my time is dwindling and I have so much to tell you. Uh, but even cross VPC connectivity, if you needed certain type of VPN applications, right, where you now needed to implement a Cisco VPN appliance instead of a, a native Amazon uh, VPN, that runs a lot of money to run one of those instances, a Cisco instance, right? Or any other kind of specialized appliance. So you have to keep that in mind as well. Again, lessons learned. Um, monitoring and alerting is something that you're gonna be running all the time, right? And you're gonna need to make sure you morph over. For us, CloudWatch, without a doubt, you, you know, we're, we're grabbing all of those CloudWatch metrics. We're, uh, you wanna be, Careful setting alarms because that's something where if you're going to use CloudWatch to do all your alerting, then that's a decision you should actively make. Be very careful of onesie one-offing it, an alarm here, an alarm there. 
So we basically take all our CloudWatch data, we feed it into Sumo Logic, and that's our uh, log analytics. There's all sorts of analytic tools out there, so I, I'm just sharing that that's one tool that we use for our analytics and bubbling up alerts, changes in security groups, right? So, the, as a sim, uh, we were using it. Uh, CloudWatch is definitely required. We, we process all of the logs. Um, dedicated accounts, so we have a number of dedicated Amazon accounts. It may not be that big of a difference today because there's more functionality between accounts, but when we were doing it and because of legacy uh, acquisitions, we wound up having all of these dedicated accounts and it's worked out well for us. And we use roles to allow people to get to other accounts without having to log back in. That's something that will benefit you. And then, and then I say, what's your bench look like here, right? Um, certifications are very helpful. I encourage the, the, the IT team members and anybody on our engineering team to get certifications. I think they're, they're eye-opening. They really help you to understand areas where you wouldn't necessarily deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Plus, if you're going to be interacting with all of your engineers, you better know what you're talking about, right? So. Uh, certs, and by the way, I do have uh, on SlideShare, I've got a whole three-pager with all sorts of links on certs and training and newsletters and things like that. If you just look up my, la my last name on, um, on uh, SlideShare, you you'll see that what I'm talking about, PDF, very convenient and helpful for you of things that I compiled along the way. Um, and of course, staying in touch with your Amazon, your SA, your TAM, uh, making sure that you're communicating with them, letting them know what they're doing. So I can't say enough about communications. It's all about communications. Engineering, management, executive team, leadership circle, finance, dev and IT engineers, product owners, stakeholders, you got to communicate with them. You got to make sure they're aware of what the plan is, when it's going to be executed, how much it's going to cost, what the resources are, what, setting expectations, right? Um, Meeting frequently, that's one thing we did in our migration. We met all the time. If there was something that we needed to regroup on, maybe, maybe your, uh, your strategy is now being offset by a tactical move. So we would wind up doing that and, and meeting and discussing it and working it through. The culture of teamwork must be present. If you have groups that are conflicting, bad news, not going to work. You've got to have everybody on board. They all need to be rowing in the same direction. Find the right blend of consulting and internal expertise. With Extreme Reach, we wanted to continue to develop the internal expertise, so we were very hesitant to go with a full onslaught of a consulting firm, plus the amount of money that that costs is pretty tremendous. So you gotta weigh, you gotta weigh what you're doing there. For us, it worked out. We developed a lot of in-house talent, and we called upon people, uh, including discussions through meetups, to find out the information we need including talking with our Amazon reps as well. So develop your internal staff and your system, uh, your subject matter experts, and be in touch with your Amazon SA and network. I highly recommend you join the meetup groups, get out in the community, and talk face-to-face -face with like-minded individuals because don't underestimate that power of face-to-face. -face. It will bring about all sorts of, uh, of information for you. So it's just some final thoughts here. I'm rounding the corner. I'm right at the end here. So exiting from on-prem, when it exit from on-prem when it's right for your business. Don't feel the pressure of we need to be we need to innovate more, so we need to get into the cloud. It may not make business sense for you. If you've got a data center, you've got two years left on that contract, and you've got servers that are still pumping along, why spend the money on OpEx when you've already invested the CapEx? and you could just use those servers until they're done with, right? So there's a, there's a time and a place to move to the cloud. It's not always right now. Leverage the well-architected framework. So Amazon has a review process that they'll do with you once you're getting into or in the cloud, and they'll actually review all, they'll ask you a bunch of questions, and they'll, uh, at, at minimum, if anything, it'll just validate that you're doing the right things. And if you're not doing the right things, they'll let you know. Costs are a moving target. You, you got to get a handle on it. Now, there are, there are solutions that allow you to, um, like uh, Cloud Checker and cl uh, Cloud Health and those kinds of tools that will help you keep 
management on cost. We wound up doing it pretty much ourselves and couldn't justify the cost of add-on solutions. And so I'm not saying we're perfect, but we've done a pretty good job of keeping our costs down and keeping on top of it. And I do recommend that you meet monthly on that at minimum. And then continually iterating, right? Just because you've set something in place and it's working doesn't mean it's the best solution. Our FTP solution that I showed you earlier, that's a very costly FTP solution. I guarantee you I'm looking for a better solution. And that's it. I'm so sorry that we went so long, but can I take some questions? Can I take questions? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So feel free to hit me up after this. And uh, thank you for coming out today. All right. <laughs>